and welcome to the uh, September 26th, 2016 Mayor's Commission for Citizens with Disabilities meeting. I'd like to welcome you all who are here and watching on uh, watching at home as well. Um, my name is Mike Masker. I'm the chair of the commission and I always like to start out our meetings with just kind of giving a reminder as to why we're here and then we'll go around the horn and do some introductions. Uh, we have a, a little bit of old business to discuss and then we'll um, get our presenters uh, on camera here. So um, just a reminder, we're here to promote the quality of life, accessibility and equity in all aspects related to the city of Omaha on behalf of and in cooperation with the citizens of Omaha who experience disabilities. Um, some of the things that we're called to do is to advise the mayor, the city council, city department heads, and other city of Omaha personnel on issues of access, representation, employment, housing, and quality of life affecting city citizens with disabilities and their respective families. Um, we're also here to serve as a resource for Omaha citizens with disabilities and their families to express concerns and resolutions regarding issues affecting them. So there's a number of other things that, we, um, that we've been called to do, but generally speaking, we're here to help um, really advocate for the needs of persons in the, in the community that may have a disability. So um, we'd like to just take an opportunity, if we could, to go around the horn, and we'll start with Mark on my left to do quick introductions. Hi, uh, my name is Mark Smith. Um, I serve and work at the Univers University Center on Disabilities at the Monroe Meyer Institute on the University of Nebraska Medical Center campus. Uh, we uh, provide training, technical assistance, um, and a variety of other services uh, to uh, intellectuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities and their families, as well as genetic disorders, physical uh, ambulation issues, et cetera. So, Glad to be here. My name is Joel Cook, and uh, I represent individuals in the community with physical and mobility impairments. Um, I work at Medical Solutions, and uh, glad to be here. Oh, <laughs> I'm Wendy Hamilton. I represent um, adults with autism spectrum disorders. My mother has autism, so I'm the relative uh, child of a person with autism. And I personally represent um, individuals with uh, connective tissue disorders. I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. My name is Ed Armstrong. I represent adults with physical disabilities. I work for QLI, which is a brain and spinal cord injury rehabilitation center in Omaha. And I'm Jan Blosser. I'm the Executive Director for Mosaic in Omaha, and we represent people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And again, my name is Mike Masker. Um, my paying job is with uh, CHI Health, a manual rehabilitation institute where we uh, serve persons with, uh, with physical disabilities, um, including brain injury, spinal cord injury, stroke, and amputation, as well as other neurological um, issues. So, Wanted to just um, do a quick recap. Um, Joel and I were invited to a meeting with um, with Kurt Hofer and a, a number of developers. I'm going to see if Joel could give us a quick rundown of our meeting a few weeks ago and just kind of share um, some of the input that we've given and a little bit about the project that's uh, that's being pr proposed. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it was a it was a really interesting meeting uh, that we had. Um, we were really grateful that they reached out to us. Um, to provide our input um, and uh, just to find out more about the project. Basically, the project is, is going to be fairly extensive. Um, it's going to be off of 192nd and Dodge here in Omaha. And uh, it's going to be about 200 acres, so it's going to be a very large uh, area. And um, it's going to be kind of a mix of, of retail, residential, and um, various other uh, walking trails. Um, there's going to be a, a kind of a senior living area as well on the on the west side and um, so yeah so we had the opportunity to to learn more about the project and kind of give um, our perspective on what um, they might need to do in regards to accessibility and um, making the whole area easier for individuals with physical challenges um, or uh, disabilities um, just to get around um, regarding, you know, uh, just the layouts and, and that kind of thing. So um, they're going to, the timeline is, I think they were, said they were going to start breaking ground um, next spring and then buildings would start going up 
maybe about a year from now. So um, they're having it put in front of the city right now. And um, so if things move forward, that's kind of the timeline. So. Well, the, the interesting thing, too, about the project is it, uh, it's kind of taking the focus away from cars as far as the, mm -hmm. how the, um, the traffic flow is, is going to be laid out. It's much different than, than what uh, I think a lot of the typical areas in town where there's a focus on how do we get cars through from point A to point B as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. where um, this will still allow for optimal traffic flow, but it's really focused on uh, the pedestrian, folks on bikes, um, you know, as well as making sure traffic flows as it should. So pretty exciting, but we were honored to be a part of just um, giving feedback and um, really sharing some of our thoughts on how we can make the area more accessible. And um, it really is very inclusive for all. So I thought that yeah. was awesome. So yeah, thanks, Joel. Um, just a reminder that uh, um, we rebroadcast our meetings at 7 o'clock every Tuesday on um, Cox Channel 18, as well as CenturyLink Channel 69. Um, so if you miss any exciting minutes of our meeting, please make sure to set your DVR, um, you know, because you probably want to watch it at least two or three times, I'm guessing. It, it's, it's relatively awesome. So uh, you can also find information about our um, commission at the City of Omaha website. Go to the Mayor's page, or if you just Google Omaha Disabilities Commission, it'll take you right to our our web page and it has all of our contact information so if you want to reach out to us with issues you may be um, experiencing or uh, topics that you'd like for us to discuss in our meetings please feel free to reach out to us um, we do have a pre-meeting before each of our meetings um, we had a quorum um, not a lot of old old news to discuss we are working still to find um, a date and time that will work to have an off-site meeting potentially at UNO and we'll We'll discuss that, um, and then we also discuss the project with, with uh, Kurt Hofer and his group. Um, so with that, we'll uh, um, invite our guest up to the, the podium. We have Joanna and uh, Amelise from uh, First National, and they're with the Enable Savings Plan, which we are super excited about. I have to tell you, this is, a, I think, a, a huge step in the right direction for persons that have disabilities that rely on on Medicaid, um, and uh, I think it's exciting to see this uh, this come forward. So, oh, one thing I forgot to do was welcome Annie, our uh, our sign language interpreter. Um, Annie is an important part of our team, so I don't want to miss making sure that she uh, uh, gets recognized as well. Welcome, Annie. So, Amelise, to you. Well, thank you. Thanks for having Joanne and I this afternoon to share a little bit about Enable Savings with the Commission and the City of Omaha. Uh, we do have a presentation that we have given across the state of Nebraska. Um, don't want to spend our entire time just focus on the presentation. I want to invite the Commission to be able to ask questions. Um, so have more of a discussion, but we'll slip through the slides that way you can see some of the information and have that on record for when you do DVR the, the show and be able to watch it in your own time. So with that, the Enable Savings Program exists um, from the Achieving a Better Life Experience Act, which is a federal act that was signed into law in December of uh, 2014. And what that allowed is state-sponsored tax advantage savings programs for eligible individuals to save for their qualified disability expenses without impacting eligibility for their resource-based public benefits. So we're talking about services like SSI or Supplemental Security Income and Medicaid like Mike mentioned. The ENABLE or the ABLE Act is an amendment to IRS Service Code 529. So you'll see some similarities with the College Savings 529 programs like NEST in Nebraska. And I'm going to click this window away real quick. Um, eligible individuals are now permitted to save beyond their resource limits for SSI and Medicaid. So it allows folks to have money in their own name for their benefit without that impact to their resource benefits. They can save up to $14,000 per calendar year, um, and the programs are meant to work alongside with existing pro programs, not take over or supplant those SSI and Medicaid services. In Nebraska, maybe. Oh, I see. Technical difficulties, I'm new at this, I guess. 
Oh, or not. Here, we'll try this. There we go. So in Nebraska, we signed our ABLE Act in 2015, which allowed our state to start planning how we were going to administer these accounts. And these, our Nebraska State Treasurer, Mr. Don Stenberg, is our trustee. So this program is run through the state. First National Bank of Omaha, where Joanna and I work, uh, are the program manager. So we work alongside with the state treasurer to provide the service to Nebraskans and any eligible individual across the United States. So there's no residency requirement tied to these programs. The other thing I would note is that you do not have to bank with First National in order to fully access these programs. So we're the program manager bringing these, the service to anyone who is eligible. In the next few slides, we're going to talk about account ownership. And so that's going to talk about the eligibility requirements and as well as what does it mean to be an account owner. An eligible, oh man, I'm really struggling with this. I don't want to X out and mess. I'm going to let our, our support team step in here. That's why we have Sam. Yeah. He keeps us on the straight and narrow. <laughs> that's it. Thank you, Sam. Do you want eligibility? Yes, I do. Thank you. So an eligible individual is, design, is defined as anyone of any age who experienced their disability onset prior to the age of 26. So that's not necessarily the same thing as an entitlement date for a federal benefit program or even a diagnosis date. It's the onset of that disability experience. So for someone whose onset was prior to the age of 26 and they're an SSI or an SSDI recipient, they are automatically eligible for ABLE. For individuals whose onset was prior to age 26 but they don't receive a federal benefit program, they can still be eligible for an ABLE through a certain certification from a physician that states their disability started before 26 and is expected to last more than 12 months or result in death with a severity level similar to that of those who are eligible for SSI or SSDI. So what that means is that you don't have to be 26 today to open the account. We, our youngest account owner is less than a year old, and our oldest account owner is in his 80s. So it's really anyone of any age can access the accounts, provided that eligibility date is met. When someone goes to enroll, they won't have to provide any information to enable to certify their eligibility. They'll, they'll complete a self-certification, a check mark that says, my disability started before 26, and I either receive SSI or SSDI, or I have that written certification from my doctor to support my eligibility. And I'm not going to mess up the slide change this time. So an account uh, for eligible individuals, this is really a, the first time a lot of them are able to save funds in their own name. So for the remainder of our discussion today, when I reference an account owner, I'm talking about that eligible individual. So an account owner anywhere nationwide can only have one active ABLE plan open. So if someone were to open another state's ABLE program and want to roll over into the ENABLE savings plan, they would have to close out their existing ABLE program before having their funds transferred into ENABLE. The account owner is always the owner of all the funds in the account. They're the only beneficiary to these accounts at all times. Now we know some individuals with disabilities can't manage the money and manage their own money for a variety of different reasons. So we've recognized that as a plan. If an account owner is a minor under the age of 18, his or her parent or legal guardian will open the account and manage it on his or her behalf until he becomes of age and can manage it on his own. If the account owner has a conservator, a guardian, or a power of attorney, that individual becomes the authorized individual to manage and open the account. So that's different from a representative payee for Social Security Administration. A representative payee is designed to manage Social Security funds. Uh, that does not allow someone to open up investment options or bank accounts for, an for their representative payee person. So it can only be a conservator, guardian, or power of attorney that can open and manage these accounts. I think Mike has a question. Yeah, I had a quick question on Elise. Um, so how many states now have, um, have is there the opportunity to open an ABLE account? And then is, is there a central, like, uh, system that communicates so that you know that, you know, if someone's opened one in another state that they're not eligible to open it here? Uh, yeah. 
two good questions. So the first half, there are currently four ABLE programs nationwide. There is Nebraska's ENABLE program, Ohio's STABLE program, and Tennessee's ABLE program. Those three are na nationwide programs, which means no residency required requirement tied to those states. Florida has the Florida ABLE program, but they have a state residency requirement. So only Florida folks who meet, otherwise meet the eligibility requirements can open up the Florida account. And there are other plans that are expected to launch later this year as well. As far as a collective database of account owners, there's not something where we would ha be able to say, let me look up Mike to see if he has another uh, ABLE account nationwide. Uh, that would really be the responsibility of the account owner to disclose that he or she has another account. However, you c there is a National ABLE Resource Center where one could go online, learn about the ABLE Act, and research what the status is for their state and their ABLE program in their state. So you can actually, there's a map of the United States, they could click on their state to find out more information, click on Nebraska, and it takes you to the Enable Savings site. Um, will you tell us at some point how Nebraska became one of those four, or is this the time to ask that? Uh, this can certainly be the time <laughs> to ask that. Uh, so Nebraska, well, how we became one of the top four, I guess, is that really we had strong advocates on a state level that really understood the importance of the ABLE Act on a federal level and really made a concerted effort to help Nebraska's legislative uh, community push that along. Um, so State Senator Kate Boltz was a major player in that um, and really truly understands the importance of this act uh, to individuals and Nebraskans with disabilities. So uh, through her efforts and the efforts of several community leaders, not just in Omaha but statewide, uh, explaining why this was so important uh, is really what led to the act being in Nebraska being passed. Uh, from there, it's the, the strong effort from the state treasurer's office also understanding the importance of the act, wanting to move as quickly as possible to allow Nebraskans to be able to save and not, in a sense, waste more time with those resource limits and providing the service as quickly as possible. So the state treasurer's office asked for those um, proposals as quickly as possible and moved very quickly in his decision uh, to pick First National Bank as the program manager. And then our relationship with the state treasurer, we're fortunate enough to have a very close working relationship through our 529 program. And that's what really helped forge this program forward. And we all agreed that sooner rather than later was the important piece in bringing this program to Nebraska and then subsequently nationwide. So for clarification though, it's not that, that, that there are only four states plus Florida who have passed this legislation, it's just that there are only four plans plus Florida? I guess that's where I'm getting confused. I know Nebraska sure. was among the first to pass the legislation, mm -hmm. but aren't there something like 38 or 40 states that have now passed it? There are several states that have passed the legislation, but the plans that I mentioned, Ohio, Tennessee, Florida, and Nebraska, are the only live plans. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Yep. Got it. So, and then when I mentioned that there are other states that are intending to go live, their legislation's been passed. They're currently developing their program to then go live. Great, thank you. Yep, definitely. Other questions right now? Uh, yeah, I had one, sorry, oh, sure. one more. Oh, sure, no, go ahead. Um, so have the other states since you guys are kind of the, you know, the, the pioneers, have, have you been helping to coach and guide other states and how to set the, their plans up? Um, so, well, as far as the ones that are already live, uh, we do have discussions through webinars and different um, conferences and organizations that we work through to just share information about what are the questions that are coming up frequently, um, and just, in a sense, we're, we're all doing the same thing. We all want individuals with disabilities to be able to advance and really have true asset development uh, for their long-term goals and short-term goals. So we, we, though they're competitors, we're all in this, in this together. So answering those questions and making sure that the information is um, public and out there and supported is really all our main focus. And that's why that ABLE National Resource Center is, is so critical to, our, to all of us sharing information. Uh, so that's really the hub of where you can find all that general information and compare and contrast the different plans. Okay. Um, as far as working with other states uh, to develop their plans, um, that's not really part of my role. It's part of uh, managing director's role, Deborah Goodkin, 
And so she, along with the state treasurer's office, uh, answer those questions for those states who are looking for more resources, resources on starting their plans. So anyone have that kind of question could either reach out to the state treasurer's office or Deborah Good can correctly, and they would be your point of contact for that. Yes, um, Mark? In my role, I, I travel quite a bit. I'm at, in Washington, D.C. and other states, and I can tell you that other states are watching Nebraska and the other states that are at implementing to see how things turn out. So we are, we are in the spotlight, so to speak, uh, at least from what I've been told. As we should be, <laughs> right? <laughs> For sure. Oh, yes, and yep, Joanna um, also wanted me to clarify that there are some states who do not intend to offer a state plan to their residents um, for a variety of reasons. Some are because there's, there are smaller states with lower population and the cost to develop these programs and provide the programs um, might be a bit challenging in their areas. Uh, so, the, and that's why the ABLE Act allows for that national piece to be uh, tied to state plans and why Nebraska opted for no residency requirement to allow those individuals who live in states where there's no legislation currently or no intended state plan to be able to access the same savings benefits as someone who lives in Nebraska. And uh, that information, again, would be on that ABLE Resource Center. All right. Okay, so we're gonna move on here, but please keep answering questions. I think that's the best way to learn about this information. So for account owners who receive Medicaid, there is a reimbursement clause in the federal act. And what that states is that for individuals who have an active ABLE account and actively receive Medicaid, upon their death, Medicaid can collect reimbursement in the funds left in the ABLE account. So this is not just specific to enable, it's part of the federal legislation. So to clarify that with an example, if I were a Medicaid recipient and I decided to open up my enable savings plan today and I then had two years before I pass away, it would only be that two year period where I concurrently had my enable plan and concurrently received Medicaid that Medicaid could collect reimbursement for the services they provided me. Uh, now that reimbursement can only come after any existing disability debt is uh, resolved and any funeral or end of life expenses are resolved with the family. If an individual did not have Medicaid or there's still funds left in the Enable account after Medicaid's reimbursement, any leftover assets would go through their last will and testament or the probate system. There's not a secondary beneficiary to these accounts like you might see in a retirement account. When an account's opened, an account owner will certify that his if his eligibility status were to change, he'll inform the plan. That's in place for those individuals who experience disabilities of any cyclical nature or periods of remission, still allowing them to fully access the accounts during the periods they need it without any penalty. The ENABLE account, like the Federal ABLE Act, is designed for qualified disability expenses. And what you can see on your screen now are categories of those disability-related expenses. Um, this is not meant to be a end-all, be-all list, nor is it meant to be a black and white list, because everyone's disability experience is different and unique. So there are some individuals who, whose transportation costs would very much be tied to an ABLE Act expense. There's others where it may not be the case. So again, the, what you use your Enable Savings Account funds for or tied to the disability experience. And we could go on for hours about different examples about that. So just make sure that you're tying it to your disability experience, you're keeping your receipts, um, and any documentation that supports why that's tied to the disability experience. The next couple slides are going to go over the impact to our resource-based benefits. Uh, the first three are specifically tied to SSI, and the last one is tied to the Medicaid uh, services. So the best way to learn about the impact to Social Security-related benefits for SSI recipients is actually to visit the Social Security Administration's Program Operation Manual System for the ABLE Act. And the easiest way to get there is to just open up a Google search browser and type in SSA space POMS space A-B-L-E, and the first link that comes up will take you directly to the program operations uh, manual, 
and it has many examples of four SSI recipients so they fully understand how their um, the impact to ABLE benefits. So, but in short, the first $100,000 in assets in an ENABLE account are exempt from the resource limit. So that traditional checking account that an individual who has SSI has is tied to $2,000 or less. And there are uh, implications to their SSI benefit when they save more than that $2,000 limit. Saving in the ENABLE account allows them to save above that $2,000 still remain fully eligible for SSI and any other subsequent programs like Medicaid waiver services. Uh, retained housing qualified expenses are also excluded resources. So if you were to pull money out of your Enable account, um, move it into that traditional checking account and carry it over month to month for a non-housing expense, that would not count towards your resource limit. However, on the other hand, a retained housing qualified expense should be used within the same calendar month. So if you pull money out of the ENABLE account for housing or any related housing expense, you want to use it within the same calendar month. The reason for that is that SSI is intended for housing and food. So you want to continue to use your SSI resource as intended. Um, as far as income exclusions, any contribution to an ENABLE account is excluded as far as an income calculation. So if a mother were to put in $5,000 into her son's uh, enable account and he's an SSI recipient, that $5,000 isn't going to count towards his SSI income calculation. Now if he's working, an account owner is working, and he places his wages into an enable account, he's still going to have be, uh, still be impacted by the SSI income calculation for the first $50 is excluded and every other dollar counted, but he's allowed to save beyond his resource limit. So there's a difference between the income calculation and then the resource calculation. Does that make sense to you guys? So this sounds one, like math to me. <laughs> it is. <laughs> there is some math involved. Uh, essentially, what, what we're, 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 I want to make sure SSI recipients understand is, though this act allows them to save beyond their resource limit, it is, does not yet let them work more hours and keep their SSI benefit. Now there is federal legislation looking at that. It's called the Able to Work uh, Amendment. But at this point, that, that has not passed. So just know that it allows you to save. It doesn't necessarily allow you to work more hours at this time. So, and then the account earnings and withdrawals are not counted towards that income calculation either. What SSI will count is any dollar amount above $100,000 in the Enable account. So once that ENABLE account hits $100,000, any amount above that is now going to count towards that $2,000 resource limit. When the $2,000 resource limit is met because of funds in the ENABLE account, your benefits are suspended without time limit. So there's no, it's not like when you normally lose your benefits that you have 12 months for reinstatement. There's no time limit. Benefits would be reinstated after that resource limit goes below $2,000 and the person's otherwise eligible for SSI. Um, and probably most importantly, a suspension of SSI benefits because of a the enable amount does not impact Medicaid eligibility. So one could lose their SSI cash benefit, but they would retain eligibility for Medicaid indefinitely. Enable will notify account owners as they're reaching that $100,000 mark so they can decide how they're going to proceed with their savings. Um, plans. What's on screen now are some examples that are located in that Social Security Program Operation Manual System. I'm not going to spend the time reading them to you today, but note that these are exactly copied from that um, Social Security site. So I, I'd invite you to go to Google again, type in SSA, P-O-M-S, A-B-L-E, and read through these examples. It will really help you understand uh, the implications to SSI. For Medicaid recipients, any asset in an ENABLE account is ex an excluded resource for Nebraska Medicaid. So that includes individuals who receive Medicaid because of DAC or CDB benefits um, and waiver recipients. Account owners will have to still report their ENABLE account assets anytime they're required to report their assets for Medicaid, whether that be annually or at any point. And Medicaid has asked, Nebraska Medicaid has asked that Enable account owners print a copy of their statement along with that um, documentation that they normally fill out. So, and that's easy to do at any point. You can go onto the secure login for Enable and print out a current statement. 
So now we're going to talk about the Enable Account features itself. For contributions, anyone can contribute to an, an account. So it can be the account owner himself, it can be his friends, family, uh, truly anyone that's interested in supporting that account owner in asset development. Um, it, a trust and inheritance can also be funneled into the Enable account, provided that it does not exceed that $14,000 annual contribution limit. So let's say mom put in $10,000, the max anyone else could put in would be $4,000. Now that doesn't change if someone makes a withdrawal. So if then that individual who just got a $14,000 contribution spent $10,000, doesn't mean he gets an additional $10,000. It's $14,000 per year. There is federal legislation to change that to 28. So fingers crossed that'll pass uh, in the next several months. How you get your funds into the account, you can write a check to enable savings with your account number on it. It will then be mailed into the plan or um, you can even drop it off at a First National um, branch and they will mail it in for you and uh, then deposit into your account. You can set up an automatic payment to have your funds transferred at a certain period of uh, time during the month or an electronic fund transfer or even the payroll deduction we discussed with someone's wages going into the account. With withdrawals, first of all, Enable will assume that any withdrawal taken from the account is for a qualified expense. So you're not going to have to give Enable Savings a call and say, hey, I would like to take my funds out to use for this qualified expense. We're going to assume that you understand that these are for qualified expenses, that you know what those are, and they're going to use the funds because of your disability experience. You can log in or call the customer, client, uh, the customer care center to ask a check be mailed to you, the account owner, um, or mailed to a third party to pay for a service or good on your behalf. You can do an electronic fund transfer into your traditional account, or even set up a systematic withdrawal, kind of a set it and forget it type scenario. And then in the fall, we will offer a check, checking option, which would allow with, for debit card transaction as well as check writing directly from the account. Some of the tax advantages are that first the earnings in these accounts are tax deferred and tax free provided you use it for qualified disability expenses. So the earnings from the withdrawals that are not used for qualified expenses are subject to state and federal income tax as well as 10% federal tax. So and that would come into play if the IRS, because this is an amendment to a tax code, if the IRS audited someone's enable account they would look at those expenses and to say these are qualified expenses or these are non-qualified expenses. And if it's non-qualified, that's when those uh, taxes would be due for the earnings in the account. In the state of Nebraska, any individual who pays Nebraska state income tax who contributes to an Enable account may be eligible for an income tax deduction of up to $10,000 or $5,000 if they're married and filing separately. And Enable, uh, Contributors other than the account owner can also take advantage of the Enable account for estate tax benefits. Enable offers several different investment options for folks to decide how they want to go about their savings plans. The first three are target risk investment options. So these are investments that are not FDIC insured. So there's no bank, state, or federal guarantee to the, uh, to the funds. They are low-cost low cost Vanguard mutual funds, and if you visit our website at enablesavings.com, you can get a profile of all those investment options and how they're, um, how they're allocated. Um, note that those investment options may lose value, and they're really designed for folks who have a time horizon of 5 to 10 years or more. We also offer a bank savings option, which has that guarantee through the FDIC insurance of up to $250,000. Um, and for those who maybe have a shorter time horizon um, or looking to use the funds uh, quicker. In the fall when we offer the checking option, it too will be FDIC insured and really designed for those daily or repetitive expenses that you'd want the ease of a debit feature or a check writing feature. This is just a snapshot of those target risk options. Again, the information is on our website where you'd be able to say, look at the growth option and break down each of those percentages to find out what's, um, how they're allocated. For a growth option, more of the funds are going to be in the stock market, whereas the conservative option, more of the funds are going to be in bonds. So you're looking at one with a higher rate of return, but also a higher risk, and then or the lower rate of return and a lower risk. 
when an account is open, an account owner gets to select how he wants his initial contribution to be invested. So one could put all the funds into the bank savings option, or you could select uh, multiple options that make sense for your, again, savings goals and your time horizon. Anytime you contribute new funds to the account, you will also select that investment option. Um, if you do not select an investment option with that contribution, it will default to your initial contribution. So if the first time you put funds into it, you selected the bank savings, and then you put new funds in there and you don't allocate it, it'll default to bank savings. Once the funds are allocated to an investment option, you can make changes twice per calendar year. So let's say someone already has an Enable account and they have their funds in bank savings, and when the checking option goes live, they would like to move some of those funds from bank savings into the checking option. That would be an investment option change, and they have two of those per year. You can continue contributing to the account until you hit $360,000. Uh, at that point, no new contributions would be accepted, but your funds would continue to grow based on your investment options. Account fees, we have a $45 annual fee that's charged per quarter at $11.25 a quarter, regardless of the number of investment options or uh, the amount of funds in the account. There are also total asset-based fees that range from 0.5 to 0.56 percent, um, and those are not applicable to the checking option, and they're, they're not, excuse me, they're not deducted from the account. So they're kind of, um, for example, the bank savings option has a rate of return of 1 percent, but after the fee, it's 0.5 that goes into your, uh, goes into the account itself. Um, otherwise, there are no other fees to enroll, transact, withdraw, or change investment options. Uh, we're very transparent with our fees. I understand that you can go get a checking account that does not have a fee associated with it. Um, however, note that these are investment options. Even if you're selecting the checking account feature, uh, this, these are designed to help folks save and develop uh, assets over time. And it also allows for that protection to SSI and Medicaid services. So it's, it's not like a traditional account. So um, that, and that the fee really truly allows uh, the First National to bring the program to, to folks in Nebraska and nationwide. How you can connect with Enable Savings, the easiest way is definitely to visit our website at enablesavings.com. Uh, we have information about the ABLE Act and all the information that we covered today. We also have a blog that tells you a little bit about what we're doing in the community, how we're, how we're connecting with those nationwide, um, and has just news and events that we feel are important for any account owners or prospective account owners. We also have a Facebook page uh, that you can find at facebook.com slash enable savings plan. We'd love for you all to share and like our page. It again shares information about uh, what we're doing in the community, news and events, and other just resources that we feel are important for account owners and their families. The client uh, customer service center is, uh, the number is posted on here, it's 1-844-ENABLE-4, which is 1-844-362-2534. Or you can send an email to clientservices at enablesavings.com. Uh, they are open 8 to 8, Monday through Friday, uh, uh, central time. So, and at last audit, they were receiving calls within 30 seconds. So there's no wait time. So you can call now and get more information about the plan. Um, and they can walk you through any questions you have about enrollment um, or any questions about the act itself. Nice. Can you um, go back to the investment option one? I yes. thought of a question after you kind of flip past it. Um, so you mentioned the time, kind of the time horizons, um, mm -hmm. like of the different investment options. So let's say I put something into the, the Vanguard funds and ended up needing them. Um, and you may have mentioned this, I apologize, but if you, let's say you choose that investment option, um, you're a little short on the savings or the checking option. Is there a penalty for pulling money out of those um, those funds if you needed it tomorrow? You can ask, actually the withdrawal options that we covered are valid for any of the investment options. Okay. So just because you select those target risk options and you're intending to maybe have a longer term savings doesn't mean you can't access those funds when you need it. So okay. you might be intending to save for a new wheelchair um, in five years, but then your wheelchair breaks tomorrow and you need to access those funds quicker than originally anticipated. So any of those withdrawal options, aside from having the debit card and the check book, which are only for the checking option, 
all the other withdrawal options are the same for any of the investment options. Good. Yeah, I know sometimes with uh, with mutual funds, there's a, you know, if you get in within 60 days, there's a penalty for getting out of them too quickly or what have you, but that's not the case here, so. No, that's not the case. I'm sorry. They're institutional funds, is what oh, Joanna's gotcha. telling okay. me. So that's what makes it makes the difference. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. So how long would it take to access the funds? If we make a request, when can you, when would somebody anticipate being able to have access to those funds? Yeah, that's a great question. So aside again from that checking option, which would allow for that direct withdrawal, um, going online and asking for a check to be mailed or an electronic fund transfer. We intend those to be processed within that same business day or next business day. So it's going to be like accessing your traditional checking or savings account and getting a withdrawal from there. Um, now note that once if you're asking for a written check, you're going to have the print time and then the mail time. But the idea is that it's responsive and immediate so folks can get to their funds as quickly as needed um, without any of that lag time. So certainly not looking at weeks, we're looking at days. Unless you fall on a weekend or a holiday, then adding that extra time, of course. Do, do most people have maybe two account options? Maybe they have the checking account, but then they, they also have another long-term savings account. So do people kind of have, have two? Yeah, you know, it, it, it really depends on, on the individual. Um, you know, I would suspect that folks who are maybe younger account owners might have um, funds in those accounts where they can save for a longer period of time. But they're really, each of the investment options are really designed to be able to be used for, for anyone. So um, I wouldn't say that they're, the checking option, right, is not live yet, so we don't have any data on that specifically. But as far as the, the target, three target risk options and the big savings option, we really see just folks using them for different reasons right. um, and, and different intents. So, and that's why we wanted to have a, a kind of a diverse option for folks so right. they, they can have that percentage um, either putting it all in there or moving it around um, or having multiple options right. so yeah it just seems like an, a natural way to do it you know if I think about my my own finances I we have yeah. a checking account but then we have a stock market account as well so I think it's nice just for people to just to return to that normality of yeah. how they manage and, their and finances. And that's really we got the feedback from the community itself in developing the plan um, but the team from the state treasurer's office as well as the team from First National met with various organizations across the state of Nebraska and nationwide to get feedback on what, what does the community want and what makes sense and this is what was settled on is to have a variety of options that speak to a variety of ages and a variety of needs um, so you're, you're, you feel like you have uh, options and ultimately we want to make sure account owners have control over their assets. Um, so hopefully this, this allows them to, to have that control, that choice in how they want to invest, and ultimately that choice in how they want to, to save for their long-term and short-term goals. Right, right. Can you explain kind of basic differences between an Enable account and a disability savings plan? Um, I guess, yeah, I'm not sure I know what a disability savings plan is. You might have to... Not a special needs trust, I assume. Maybe that's what I meant. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, assuming, Wendy, that you meant a special needs trust, uh, I, I certainly can. Cool. First, I would point out that on our website, under the Resources tab, on the Enable You category, there is a resor uh, resource sheet that's uh, printable and downloadable that allows you to uh, compare and contrast special needs trusts as well as uh, the Enable Savings Plan. But in, in general, uh, the Enable Savings Plan, like all ABLE plans, has that annual contribution limit of $14,000 per calendar year, whereas a trust can be set up for much more than that. Um, it, some trusts have stipulations on what you can spend funds for, um, such as sometimes housing is not permitted to be used from a trust, whereas housing is a permitted expense from Enable. Um, sometimes trusts, there are steps to be able to withdraw the funds, uh, whereas Enable, it's simply logging on or requesting by calling the call center to get your funds removed from the account um, or using the checking option when that's live. Um, a, a special needs trust can feed an Enable account, but an Enable account cannot feed a special needs trust. So those are just some of the basic differences, but I would definitely look at, at that resource sheet. There's a nice 
on the front, there's a lot of text, but on the second page, it's a chart that outlines the differences between uh, both a third person, a first person special needs trust, and then the enable account. Right, and there's certainly then the, the affordability of the enable account versus a special needs trust. Um, depending on the, the legal counsel that's working on your trust, at times there are amounts that they, um, I don't want to say maybe require, but um, uh, request in order to really make that, that trust a value for the, the beneficiary. So a lot of the lawyers that we've met with have said, um, you know, you're really looking at needing X amount of money to really make this trust valuable um, and, and really benefit that trustee or beneficiary, excuse me. Whereas at the Enable account, um, the minimum balance or the minimum contribution to start an account is $50. So you're really having that affordability of being able to start saving um, at, at without a lot of money and be able to build on it over time versus the trust needing a, a large amount to get started. Um, so going back to the eligibility, so let's say if you have a person who's over the age of 26 mm -hmm. um, and they get hurt, for them to be eligible, they did, did I see that you have to have a, a, a note from the doctor? It actually, the onset had to occur prior to age 26 okay. at this point. Now there is federal legislation to change that disability onset date to 46. Uh, really to open it up for a variety of different disability groups right. that don't have an onset prior to 26. Right. Um, you know, where you work might be a great example of that. Folks yeah. with brain injury and spinal cord injuries right. don't all become uh, injured before age 26. <laughs> lots of things happen after <laughs> yeah, 26, lots, that's right. Lots of, things, lots of things. And so there are also conditions like MS um, or ALS that we see folks being able to benefit from these types of accounts that aren't necessarily onset before 26. Right. So on a, on a federal national level, there is a push to change that to, to 46. Now, uh, veterans would also be another population that opening up that age would, would benefit over time. So that's with, um, I mentioned able to work earlier. That same legislative package includes the changing from $14,000 to 28 per annual year, right. the age from 26 to 46 and then looking at the expansion of the work benefits for individuals. I'll just do a quick plug on that. I was on the, one of the early uh, teams representing community organizations for the statewide team. And originally, I believe the proposed age of onset was like 21. So even the fact that it's bumped to 26 is a good sign, and hopefully we'll be able to, to keep pushing it forward. So that made me feel good when you announced, when you said 26, because last I heard it was younger than that. So. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully we'll, we'll keep pushing keep pushing forward. And there's so many folks that are, are championing this on a, on a national level that really understand uh, the needs of the community and where it needs to go. So there's strong voices uh, out there advocating for those groups. Does it look likely? I mean, the, the able to work, is it looking pretty good? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think, again, those, those national voices are very strong and very committed to the advancement of the ABLE Act. Um, and I, I doubt they're going to back off anytime soon. So well, it's, you know, the I thing... Think, oh, sure. It, it's uh, it, it's kind of disheartening for folks that, you know, who serve persons with disabilities because the system is really set up to keep them down, you know. So this is a great step and the able to work is... Yeah. It, it's kind of a no-brainer, really. Yeah, you know? and yeah, this ABLE is really a culture change. Where, um, whereas previous to ABLE, it was don't save for your child mm -hmm. who has right. a disability. Um, find find a way to spend this money before the first of the month comes right. around. Yeah. Um, and a, and a, a lot of um, coordination just to get the services you need to be as independent as possible in the community. Um, so th this is a culture change. This is now saying you don't have to be poor to benefit from services. You, you can benefit from services and be an inclusive member of the community and uh, continue to use your talents. However those, however those formulate or, or, or manifest, you use those talents um, and, and really truly everybody wins in that scenario. Yeah, so th sure. those folks on a national level are really pushing um, uh, uh, very strongly. So we, we don't have any reason to believe those won't pass. It's just a matter of when it'll occur. It is an election year, so there's a lot of things going on right now. Um, I don't know if you've heard, so, uh, but there's a lot going on. The so debates tonight. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
So we'll see. But we'll, those are things that we would put on our blog and keep, um, keep folks updated via Facebook so they know if there's any changes on a federal level, we are going to be immediately responsive to those changes. That's awesome. Um, I just had one other quick question, and then we have time for maybe just one more. Do you have um, rough numbers on how many folks are signed up um, and participating? Uh, I'll let Joanna answer that question. Yep, just under 200, it looks like last count. So. Okay, for your, for your plan? For, yes, for so the savings plan. So we don't know nationwide plan. how many others are signed up yet? just under 2,000 nationwide, so with all, with all the plans combined would be our estimate. Okay, thanks. And Emily's, how, how many of those are Nebraskans, or how, how much interest is coming from outside of Yeah, the that, that's a good question, Mark. Um, so with our, our accounts, about 30% are out of state. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, and a lot, I, you can imagine a lot of those uh, out of state folks are kind of our surrounding neighbors, um, but we have accounts as far away as California, um, and even pushing out east, despite having several of the accounts living in the East Coast area. So um, folks are just doing their research and, and trying to find out the plan that makes the most sense for them. And we continue to have uh, answer those questions and be available to those folks so they can make a great decision for themselves. Well, thank you. We really appreciate you both being here. It's, uh, it's great information, and, and we truly are excited to to see that uh, things are getting started and it's good to see us on the forefront see nebraskans out yeah, there yeah definitely yeah i know definitely. it's like we, doing something. we weren't pioneers for anything right yeah, absolutely so. well it's um it's good to be on the map for something that's really so meaningful so thank you we'll probably have you guys back again just to give us an update if that's okay yeah anytime um, and i i would say you, you mentioned that um folks in omaha or whoever's watching can email you guys if they have questions i invite them to do the same and you guys can always funnel them to us if they don't want to go onto the website, they can send us an email through there as well. But if you represent another organization and you would like us to come speak to your constituents or participants or families, mm -hmm. um, yeah, just shoot the commission an email and we will work with you to, to provide any resources we can so that folks continue learning about Enable and the ABLE Act overall. So thanks. Yeah, that's actually a great invite because um, a number of us have, whether it's support groups or, you know, meetings with uh, with family members of persons that we serve. Yeah. So actually, we prob you probably will be taken up on that. <laughs> <So> <laughs> no. Well, that, that's you. what I do. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy to do it. So just Good. let me know where, where and when I need to be there. Yeah, thank you. I'm All right. We really particular point. I think this is about the third or fourth time I've heard you present. Now. You're, I, I, I just know that you're one of my groupies. I know you want to hear what I have to say. So it's, it's, it's all good. No, it's, it's, it's good. great. It's, it's wonderful to network with, with different folks. And Mark's involved in a, a various different levels. And, and so um, hopefully you've heard new things and, and continue to grow what you know every time we, we kind of interact with each other. Because I think the, the act itself is so so large and has so so much impact that hearing it over and over again is, is not necessarily a bad thing. I hope. And I try to keep it lively for you. It's all good, Emily. Yeah. <laughs> all good. But if, and, and if there's like a t-shirt for the fan club, let us know. I we'll yeah, I should work on so, that. You'll yeah. be the first on my that. list. Absolutely. <laughs> terrific idea. Yeah. yeah, thank you again, guys. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate uh, your time. With just a couple minutes, so if anybody has quick announcements, we can we can do those. You probably each have about a minute, so we'll start with Jan if you want to go ahead. Well, Mosaic in Omaha is having their annual Partners and Possibilities event on October, yes, October 12th at noon, and you can find out more information on our website, mosaicinfo.org. Um, I'm Ed Armstrong from QLI. I don't have any announcements today. I'm Wendy Hamilton on behalf of the Autism Society of Nebraska. I invite you to visit our website, AutismSocietyNebraska.org, and find events and uh, activities happening all across the Omaha area. Uh, I'm Joel Cook, and I represent people with uh, disabilities and mobility impairments in the community. And I don't have any additional updates or announcements at this time. And again, I'm Mark Smith from the Monroe Meyer Institute. I, I do want to mention, too, in addition to serving on the faculty there, I'm also the parent of a young man with a disability and a sibling of a young woman with a disability. So uh, we try and practice what we preach. Um, I do have an announcement. Um, you are very welcome to go on to our website, uh, UNMC for University of Nebraska Medical Center, uh, dot edu, and then forward slash MMI. 
uh, where you can learn about our new director who just started in July, Dr. Coroli Mernix, who joined us from uh, Vanderbilt University in um, Tennessee. Uh, he's, like I say, he's been with us for a few months. We're very excited uh, that we have him there. Um, our former director uh, retired a, a little while back, so uh, we're in a period of change, but uh, we're, again, very happy to have Dr. Mernix on board. He's um, a real visionary and uh, is really moving to uh, make uh, positive changes at our center and uh, it comes to us with a, a worldwide reputation as a uh, disability researcher. So uh, that would be my update. Thank you. And again, Mike Masker, uh, I represent uh, persons with physical disabilities. I work at CHI Health Emanuel Rehabilitation Institute um, where we serve persons with uh, spinal cord injury, brain injury, uh, stroke, amputee, and other neuro neurological and orthopedic issues. Um, just a quick reminder, if you go onto our website, chihelp.com, and go to um, services, you can find rehabilitation. And on our site, we have a full calendar of events. Uh, full complement of support groups for persons and their families that have had a brain injury, uh, stroke, uh, spinal cord injury, or amputation. And um, it'll give you a, an update, but those groups meet monthly. And just a great resource for, uh, for persons that uh, are looking for additional support and, and have questions. We also have um, a full complement of um, adaptive sports, and Ed and his crew um, also provide some of these for their um, their folks at QLI, but uh, um, we team up with NWA, which is the Eastern Nebraska Wheelchair Athletic Association, and the PVA Paralympic or um, sorry Paralyzed Veterans of America to form Paralympic Sports Omaha. And um, there's lots of different sports that'll be starting up here: rugby, um, bocce ball, bowling, um, wheelchair basketball. So. Um, keep an eye out for those, and if you have questions, you can certainly get a hold of us at, um, at the Emanuel Rehab Institute, and we'll be happy to help you out. Um, just a reminder again that we do rebroadcast these meetings every Tuesday on Cox Channel 18 and CenturyLink Channel 69 at 7 p.m. Um, if you have questions or would like to get in touch with us, uh, just head to the mayor's website or just Google Omaha Disabilities Commission and it'll take you right to our page where all of our contact information is listed. Uh, we do meet the fourth Monday of each month. We meet at the legislative chambers located in the Omaha Civic Center. Um, that is 1819 Farnham. Um, and our meetings are open to the public. We have a pre-meeting from 3 until 3.30, and then our, uh, our televised meeting starts at 3.30 and goes till about 4.30, so it is open to the public. Otherwise, reach out to us via our um, email or our phone numbers, which is on the website. And with that, again, I'd like to thank Annie, our sign language interpreter. Um, does a great job, and we are so thankful for her being a part of our team. Um, we have a couple members that were not here today, John Glenn with Madonna and um, Janae Hofer, who also represents persons with a mobility dis uh, disability and uh, language impairment. Um, great members of our commission, and we'll hopefully see them next month. With that, we are adjourned, and we'll see you all next month. Thanks.